just to understand Dr. Gooden now, so the cells aren't, they don't start out from their, their conception as with, a, with a, a specific function. It's something that is, is defined after, over a period of time. Oh yeah, yeah your the entire body starts from a single cell and those cells will then grow through you know, differentiation, but they actually adapt to their function. And your cells, as they grow from a single cell, and your body, as your body develops into its different organs and different systems, it adapts and learns and reinforces that function, and it becomes better and better at that function. Just like, you know, if you if you train and exercise yourself to be a football star, okay, you become better and better specialized at seeing a football, catching a football, running patterns, and so on and so forth. You become less and less functional at coding a computer, for example, right? It's quite dramatic because you can see it in your own human body from a single cell you can either get a very very long neuron we're going to talk about motor neuron disease a neuron that goes from your cortex your frontal cortex area all the way to your spinal cord and then from your spinal cord all the way down to your toes toes okay versus a fat cell that's storing fat for energy later on those all came from the same place they're exactly the same dna they're exactly the same you but they have chosen to adapt and become specialized in a certain function. And the brain really performs a few functions. The number one is it receives stimuli. And it could be visual, like you and I talk, you know, looking at each other, we can hear, we can touch, but some sort of, you know, stimulation occurs. And that could be internal, you're just your internal thoughts, right? And then your brain creates an image of that. And it says, then it interprets that image. Like, is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it hot? Is it cold? And then once it interprets that, it has to choose a course of action. What am I going to do about this? Okay, am I going to cry? Am I going to laugh? Am I going to move my finger, right? And then there's that, that execution part. So in ALS, what's happening is that execution part. All that other stuff is working, okay? They, they're hearing, they're, they're seeing, they're feeling, they're interpreting. But when it comes to executing their desire response in a motor function, that gets disturbed, okay? And that's neurons in the motor cortex. And these neurons have these very long axons that go from your brain to your spinal cord, which is called your upper neuron, and then from your spinal cord to your extremities, which is called your lower, lower motor neurons. And so these very long axons, the very long pipes, they are dependent upon the environment. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a two-lane highway across the the interstate, for example, right? And it's got gas stations along the way. And it's not like a copper wire in your walls. It actually has material, it's living. Things are going in and things, things are going down, things are going back up. And ultimately what happens in ALS is that that transport system gets disrupted. And the way the body transports down that big tube is basically the way you would squeeze toothpaste tube, for example, you know? Or you can imagine a, a soft tube with a ball in it and you kind of squeeze it, and as you squeeze it, the tube, the, the ball goes through the tube, like a peristaltic action. What does the ball represent? Organelles within, like your mitochondria, peroxisomes, Golgi, like all these different types of machinery that the end of your neuron needs, like at the, at the connection plates. So basically, it's, it's shipping raw material. It's like, it's like a semi-shipping trucks and building material and things all the way down to the end of the, the line type of thing. And, and then that part of part of what's supposed to be shipped is what tells the the foot or the the hand to to move. Or... Correct. It has that system in place. And so what happens in ALS is that these tauopathies start building up, and then this axon can't do its job. It, it can't feed itself. Like this this process of uh, transport, and these are called tauopathies. So they're they're these aberrant um, protein formations. This, this is the same, the same the, the tau, tau proteins that are found in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, very similar. Like, very similar to the neurofibrillary tangles, very similar to the tauopathies in, say, Lewy body or in uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia. And these are all highly related to your methyltransferase systems, like your homocysteine and so on. That's ultimately what gets disrupted. Well, on that point, Dr. Gooden, now, what does cause this? We've studied this years and years and years, and we understand a lot of it. And it goes down to... Fundamentally, oxidative stress okay, is where it happens, but it's oxidative stress on that particular area. And that's what happens in all these diseases. You get these specialization, and they lose one of those things, right? 
I have a big iPhone, I need a rubidium trace metal. And if you get one manufacturer in China that stops making this trace metal that I need, the entire iPhone doesn't work, for example, right? And that's what specialization does. It, it becomes, we become more and more dependent on very, very small, precise um, deviations in health. And that's what happens here in ALS. Just to clarify with you, Dr. Goodenow, so the neuron becomes specialized for a specific function and, and requires certain materials to be able to perform that. And then if, if one of those materials is no longer available, that leads to the, the decay of the neuron? Exactly. And then the targeting, where the targeting comes in, okay, is it, it's in your brain. And your brain is protected by the blood-brain barrier. Um, so, the, the, so part of the protection that protects your brain from all the environmental stuff in our world has a double-edged sword. Once something gets in your brain, then it's kind of stuck. Now, now something has come across the, the castle walls, for example. So now you've got to fight that fight on the inside versus on the outside. And that's the problem with all these brain inflammatory diseases. So Parkinson's, ALS, um, you know, Alzheimer's, autism. These are diseases that once an insult gets into your brain or even a, even a stroke or a concussion, then you have this localized issue that stays around. And this is where the, the progression occurs. Just one second. What, what leads to the, the, it getting through the blood-brain barrier? What, how does it, what, what creates that? that uh, situation where the, the toxin or it gets through the, the blood-brain barrier? This is where it becomes very frustrating, okay, because this is where we have all these epidemiological studies clearly indicating environmental toxicity is associated with ALS. But we don't know exactly which one, and it probably isn't one toxin. It's probably a variety of ones that could affect one person versus another. But we do know that very specific neurotoxins get in through our environment that will very specifically affect certain cell bodies in the body. Parkinson's is a good example. One of really good examples, a bunch of kids in the 80s were trying to make designer heroin, and they end up making this molecule called MPTP. And a bunch of 20-year-olds gave themselves Parkinson's using this molecule, which was uh, basically a, a contaminant of their designer heroin synthesis that they were doing in their home. And so, ever, so then we, we found that this molecule, wow, this can very selectively degenerate these dopaminergic neurons. And so here's an example of how a very specific toxin can be incorporated into the body, pass through the blood-brain barrier, and then affect a very, very specific cell type. It doesn't affect all. It doesn't affect your cholinergic. It doesn't affect your cognition. It affect, very specifically affects the Parkinson system, substantia nigra. That's an example. But when you talk about a disease like ALS, we know exactly what it's doing. It's knocking down very critical enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which neutralizes the superoxide radical. And that's a core, core component of oxidative stress management in every single cell of your body, not just your motor neurons. So this uh, superoxide dismutase, so I'm, if I'm saying it correctly, Dr. Goodenow, this, is this knocking out a, a particular free radical, so it, it's bringing down the oxidative stress? Exactly, exactly. So think about this, this two-lane superhighway that I was telling you about, this going down from your brain to your spinal cord, right? There's things going on and there's gonna be garbage. There's gonna be waste, right? And there's gonna be someone, there's gonna be a garbage person coming out, picking up off the waste off the freeway and taking it away. And if that job gets impaired, that is going to start building up and is gonna start having effects on the transport system, okay? And that's, a, you know, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's pretty close. Superoxide dismutase is the garbage cleanup. Okay, they're there to clean up this extra garbage as it, as it happens. And there's many different ways of doing that, but that particular one is impaired in ALS. And it just so happens that these motor neurons in the brain are super sensitive to any disruption in that particular molecule, the superoxide. Whereas other neurons say, ah, okay, I got other, I got other ways to clean up the garbage. I, you know, I can, you know, fine, that, meant, that enzyme's not working so perfect. I got another one that can kind of do part of the job and I can kind of get by. Right, but the motor neuron says, "Well, I don't have any other choice. Like, if this guy doesn't work, I'm done. Right? I got, I got no backup plan. So, in this particular case, if you get, if you get exposed to a toxin, okay, that has, that targets this particular protein, okay, you will get ALS because those motor neurons they're sensitive to that type of toxin. Can, can you give an example of something that might?" might be a toxin that would, that would cause this? Something that, what, what would trigger 
what would introduce this, uh, such a toxin into someone's body? It's probably going to be a, a trace, a metal contaminant, like a, you know, iron, copper, selenium, these places in dumps. Um, um, there's association with, with military working in certain military institutions. So there's, there's large amounts of data trying to trace this down. And it's probably going to be never completely understood because there's probably a hundred different ways of getting ALS. Okay. Um, and that's and that's what's going to be problematic. But in the end, we know what's happening. So we can we can prevent it. You know, we can reduce it if we know it's happening because we can then provide the body with backup plans, you know, with targeted nutrition and targeted supplementation for those biochemical systems. And you can reduce it and you can start restoring certain you know, muscle functions. And so there is research out there being done on that. But yeah, that's, that's what's going on. Well, that's very surprising to hear because I, my impression was that in most cases, except for very rare cases like with Stephen Hawking, it, if you get ALS, then it's virtually a death, death sentence and you have you know, three to five years or something like that to live. So the idea that there's something that can be done to, to curtail that is, uh, is surprising to hear. Yeah, well, like anything, if you do nothing, this, these epidemiological progression rates are pretty accurate, okay? But once we know, understand the biochemistry of it, so then we can start supplementing the system. And so there's lots of research been done on reducing and mitigating certain ALS activities, certainly in animal models. And then in human models, um, like I've personally seen improvements um, in individuals. And so the question is that that's a long-term battle.